it's been an interesting it's a it's a mixture of science and management and engineering and you know all kinds of optics electronics you know all that sort of stuff so it's uh it's been fun excellent excellent well we are at the top of the hour so you know dennis thank you for actually i I didn't actually intend to have you introduce yourself that way, but yeah, usually I, I, I have a little something to say, but thank you very much for that. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll turn the floor over to you after just briefly, uh, folks who are here, if you have questions for Dennis during his presentation, um, he said he'll take them uh, during the presentation. So if you have a question, um, you know, please, uh, Please go ahead, feel free, uh, you know, post something in the chat. Let me know you've got a question and then I'll, you know, I'll flag over so that we don't have people stepping on each other, asking questions. I'll, I'll peel them off as we get a chance uh, and turn the floor over to you, you folks to ask your own questions individually. And with that, Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you and welcome to Novak. Well, thank you very much for having me. And uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to this. At any rate, um, let me start off with, this is a talk, this is a large a large part of the talk I gave, uh, I think it was last year, at about this time, um, at a conference called the CalCon Conference, which is a, uh, it's a, a remote sensing instrument conference. They are primarily interested in, in the uh, calibration of things, right? You know, you, you, you measure a certain number of photons, what does that mean in terms of what's going on with the physics of the thing, right? How many... You've got an instrument that's measuring something. Are you sure that the number that your signal, the voltage you're getting out, and how does that correspond to really how many photons are coming in and what that means from, from the object that you're looking at? And so um, I kind of wanted to mix some things together, which is that, you know, at the end of the day, when you see stuff come back from missions, um, it looks like everything is just hunky-dory and everything went smooth and everything like that. And I've never had that happen. Uh, every time I've been on a mission, we've always had things that you would not expect to occur. Um, and I thought I'd sort of talk about them and then lead into the science that came out of the mission after we still got around that. So um, the picture you're seeing here is actually the launch of the New Horizons spacecraft back in 2006. Um, it, was the, it, was, it was the fastest uh, object ever launched off the Earth at the time. Um, it was... It's sort of frustrating because it, it sat there and went whoop, right out of your field of view really quickly. So, you know, you kind of want to watch things grow. All right. Um, so New Horizons, of course, is the mission to the Kuiper Belt, Pluto, and then beyond. Um, so this is, again, what I was talking about. Mercury never sleeps. I'll talk about the Ralph instrument on New Horizons mission, Tears instrument on Landsat 8. That's a uh, uh, Landsat 8 is, of course, everybody knows what Landsat 8 is. Uh, but we have a thermal infrared sensor on there. And then there's the Ovirs instrument on OSIRIS-REx, which is a sample return mission to Bennu, which is an asteroid pretty much in the same, uh, you know, at, at pretty much the same distance of the sun from the Earth. Uh, it turns out that if you look at the probability of uh, a major asteroid hitting the Earth, Bennu is the most likely to do it. It's a one in 2,000 chance in 20. 330 or something like that. Um, so it's not at all probable, but it's, it's, it's one of the reasons we went to it is, is we wanted to sort of understand the physics of, of these near earth asteroids, but you know, you have to build the things and get them there. And there's all kinds of things that happen. Let me start out with the new horizons. Um, here's what the, uh, in, what the, uh, spacecraft looks like. It's kind of the size of a, of a baby grand piano. Um, and it's going out to Pluto, so it's powered by a, a radioisotopic uh, power generation um, because you can't really do much solar power out at Pluto distance. And we have these instruments on there. And the one I'm going to talk about most is, is RALPH. Um, RALPH is not an acronym for anything. It's, it's a combined infrared uh, spectral mapper uh, and uh, sort of visible near-infrared imager. Um, and it's uh, one of the things that we do on space missions, on planetary missions, you know, you're trying to get way the heck out someplace. You really don't have a lot of power or mass or anything. So a lot of effort goes into minimizing power, minimizing mass, 
but making sure that you still get the uh, the information that you need. So let me just go to the next shot. This is this was uh, uh, New Horizons on the uh, on its uh, spacecraft, um, and it shows again where the instruments are. Ralph, that those white things are actually radiators that we use to to passively cool the detector down to about 100 Kelvin. Uh, you know, the infrared detectors, they're sensitive to uh, to sort of the thermal uh, energy, just sort of kicking electrons up and making it look like a signal. So you have to cool them down or else they saturate. At any rate, this was uh, just before it went on to the spacecraft, uh, you know, to the whole launch system. Um, and uh, uh, it's coded in that uh, uh, MLI, multi-layer insulation, again, because we have to make sure that things don't get super cold out in space where you're, you know, you're looking at a three degree Kelvin background all around you. Now the next one, this is Ralph. Um, it, it was interesting. You were talking about a 450 uh, millimeter uh, focal length. Ralph has about a 650 meter, uh, millimeter focal length. Um, and there's a picture of it over with somebody. Um, and it has these two detectors on it, LISA, which stands for the Linear Edelon Imaging Spectral Array. And that's the infrared part. And then there's MVIC, which is the multispectral visible infrared camera. Um, and again, you can see the channels over there. Pan means panchromatic. But we're taking data in uh, all those different colors so we understand what's going on on the surface. Um, and it got very interesting uh, because before we went, uh, Pluto was sort of considered to be way far out and probably a boring thing. And we'll, we'll show some data that uh, changed people's view of that. All right, this is what, what Ralph looks like. Um, and this is what it's got. It's, we, I, we look at composition information. Um, it has a spectrometer, and I, I'm not going to get into the details, but basically we cover from one and a half, from 1.25 to 2.5 microns. So that's a little bit, it's about twice as, starts at about twice as long as you can see with your eye to four times as, as long a wavelength as you can see with your eye. And we look at a lot of little narrow features in there because we're looking for the details of what's going on on the ground um, to tell us what's going on. For example, there's a, a, a in, in uh, nitrogen, when you get cold enough and it turns into solid, there's a, a feature that you can kind of tell how cold the object is because the spectrum of nitrogen changes. It, it actually changes, it does phase transitions. It's like going from one type of ice to another type of ice at different temperatures all around 43 Kelvin. So by looking at the spectrum, even though you're not looking at anything that, that in principle has anything, you're not measuring a temperature, but you're seeing the effect of a temperature on the, uh, on the spectrum of the uh, object. So that's, that's the type of thing we look for. Um, it's a, uh, when we were building it, we had all kinds of standard things. Uh, we had unexpected noise sources, and that it was hard to get the detectors. And you know, because we're using um, very specific things that have very specific cutoff wavelengths. In other words, they only go out to measure to a certain length, wavelength, or else it's so that we don't have to cool things down too much. Um, and that's the normal type of stuff, and you just keep on dealing with it. But when we were getting ready to do our last test, the test that we were going to do just before we integrated the, uh, uh, you know, ship the instrument from uh, uh, Ball Aerospace in, um, in Boulder, Colorado, to um, uh, the uh, uh, Applied Physics Laboratory here, uh, which is was doing the spacecraft and the integration of the instruments, uh, we were doing our final set of testing. And um, we had to cool down the optics. And so the way that was done was that there was a, an outside coolant that was running liquid through this vacuum chamber. Remember, we're making things look like they're in space. So the instrument is inside, pumped down, looking at liquid nitrogen uh, uh, walls so that it's kind of feeling like it's what it's like in space. And we were pumping this, uh, you know, this uh, liquid through to um, uh, make sure that uh, we got the, the optics to the right temperature. And uh, everything was going well. And then all of a sudden, at about, you know, when, we, when the temperature got down to around zero, zero Kelvin, everything stopped. 
the flow of the uh, liquid stopped. Things didn't get cold. Nobody knew what was going on. Um, and it was a very concerning situation because it, you can imagine if you're, if something is, um, is it, 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 you know, if something is broken in there, well, does that mean we're spraying this stuff all over the place and contaminating everything? And now we've got this this uh, contaminant that we'll always be seeing the spectrum of. Well, it turned out that that was not the case. What it was is the coolant was a mixture of water and antifreeze, just like it's in your car. Um, and one of the technicians saw that, oh, it was running a little lay low. So he took a container and it had the appropriate name on it. And he opened it up and he smelled it. And yep, it smelled like the, you know, the antifreeze. And he poured it in. Well, it turned out that somebody had taken that container and it, it had it had originally contained the antifreeze, but it got totally used up. And somebody then had took it and filled it with water because they wanted to use it for something else. Well, you could still smell it. It still smelled like the antifreeze. So we were pumping liquid or we were pumping liquid water, not antifreeze water, through the system. And you can imagine that since water expands when it freezes, there was a lot of concern that, oh, my gosh, we've you know broken our whole system here. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a few weeks where, or there were a few days where we were very concerned. Turned out it was all OK. It didn't it didn't break. But it's, you know, here you are. You know, these things cost lots of money uh, and there's <laughs> a lot of of of. Uh, oversight on them you know everybody's really there's a lot of documentation that's going on this is exactly what you do but things happen and so you know i i, I this was one of those things that happened and you would never expect that at any rate um we got everything in there um you know we we, we launched we took some really great data uh when we went by jupiter we we did a grab earth gra uh, jupiter gravity assist to get us out to to pluto faster um, and here we are, we're coming up to, uh, uh, you know, we, we found some problems. There was a light leak, something that we hadn't seen in our testing, but okay. We had figured out how to point the thing. So we didn't get that problem. Um, so great data at Pluto. And then on July 2nd, which was less than two weeks before we were supposed to fly by Pluto. And remember, this is a once in a lifetime thing. If you don't get the data, when you fly by Pluto, you can't go back and do it again. We're not orbiting. We're just going boop, right by. Um, suddenly, the spacecraft went into space hold, safe hold. Now, safe hold means that it's something as weird has happened. The spacecraft doesn't understand what's going on. And it's saying, I'm going to go into a safe position. So it shuts pretty much everything's down. And you start to figure out what happened. This is not something you want to see You know, less than two weeks before you're going to do your flyby. Um, well, it turned out that that we've done all kinds of uh, operations over the, we were launched in 2006, so nine and a half years that the thing had been in orbit, we had done, or excuse me, in flight, done all kinds of stuff, but we were getting to the end and people were getting overconfident. And so they tried to load up more operations than they normally did when they changed something. And it went beyond a limit of, a, of how many, how much uh, sort of memory you could use, and it went into safe hold. So I didn't get to see the 4th of July fireworks that year, but you can imagine there were a lot of fireworks when we found out that, that my goodness, we were not being able to do anything, you know, less than two weeks before we were our flyby. It was fixed in a few days, but again, you know, you keep, there, these are the type of things that happen all the time. So now we fixed, and this is why we go to, take pictures of things up close. That's Pluto when you're close. That's Pluto using the, the, you know, the thing that looks like a blurry is just the Hubble Space Telescope image of Pluto. And the Hubble Space Telescope is a darn good uh, telescope. But, you know, you have to be close to see this. And so that's why we like to go to these objects. Um, nobody expected to see a heart shape like that on Pluto. Nobody expected to see all these details. And we Actually, this is only the start of it. So let me go and um, this is Pluto and Charon um, in color. And again, um, again, we hadn't expected, we expected to see things sort of more bland. We weren't expecting to see that there's these surface features all over the place. And 
if you start looking at things in detail, so remember that heart, that heart image. Well, if you break it down into what you're seeing there on the right, um, you can start to see a lot of detail. And again, not something that we expected to see. And I'll talk about a couple of these things. Um, those objects, the one up, the number one is sort of, kind of looks like a, an ice field. It, it's what is kind of interesting about this is that you start to look at this and it kind of looks like a planet, like the Earth. But when you realize that those mountains are actually made out of water ice because it's so cold that it's a very hard thing, and they're sitting in a soil that's really solid nitrogen, you know, which you have to get down below 60 Kelvin, well, actually below 50 Kelvin for you to get um, solid nitrogen. It looks like the Earth, but it's a lot different than the Earth. Um, anyway, so this is, this is um, here you are. This looks like a, uh, 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 you know, an ice flow on Earth. You can kind of see the nitrogen ice flowing around these objects being driven by the rotational, uh, 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 you know, and, and gravitational forces on, on Pluto. Um, if you start looking more closely, well, let me, let me, we'll, we'll get to the closer things here. This is that other area that a boundary between the glacial flow and older surfaces, that black area is an older surface. And we think what's going on here is that this, um, this, this white area is nitrogen being deposited on the surface because it's coming off the surface in other places and going here because this is the coldest area on Pluto. And then you've got those, uh, those uh, mountains of water ice sitting in there that are looking like water ice uh, or looking like mountains. And they are pretty high. They're, you know, three or four or five kilometers tall. Um, but it's really different than what you see on the Earth. And now you're starting to see a little detail that you wouldn't expect on a thing that's 35, well, 34 times further from the Earth or from the Sun than the Earth is. You just don't expect to see much heating, much dynamics. But Pluto has a very odd orbit. It gets, well, it gets within the, the orbit of, Niger, or of Neptune, um, you know, when it came in. And its closest approach, I think, was like in 1988. And as we were going out, it was cooling down, but it still had some of the activity that was engendered by that time when it got closer to the sun. Because again, you're talking very cold objects here uh, being driven by uh, radiation pressure from the sun. Now you start to see these other details and you start to see the water mountains of water ice, but you also see these things on the other side. And those are things that are actually driven by Something like you'd see on Earth, you know, where you have a, a, thermo, a thermal uh, gradient. You have heat coming up from down below and then spreading out and going down and then stuff uh, goes down into the surface. So you have stuff coming up and then flowing over to the edges and going down. And that gives you these, uh, these various uh, motions of the glaciers, which are glaciers of liquid or solid nitrogen. Again, you see flows just like you see on the Earth, um, but they're driven by things that are different than on the Earth. So let's see. Um, yeah, this is just some more detail, but again, you can see that looks much like a river of ice flowing there. Um, nobody expected all this activity to be going on in a system as remote as Pluto Again, that's why we like to go to these things, because we find out that everything we know is wrong. And, uh, you know, that's our whole purpose here. Um, you can see the fund of flow moving into the Sputnik planum. That's just the name of the, uh, this area. Um, and then, whoop, and you just keep going. Ah, now this is something that's interesting also. This is, these are our... Envic color images. I and mean, again, this is why we like to look at more than just sort of a, a broad band, every, you know, black and white image. These are very, obviously very different. You can see areas that are very red, and then you can see areas that are very white. And it turns out that those areas that are very white are presumably have a different type of composition on them than the red areas. And the reason is that 
we're not sure. We're not sure whether it's because that area has, you know, lifted up and, and is newer um, formation. Or if you'll notice, these, these, uh, lit these white areas are all sort of pointing in the same direction. Well, it turns out that at the time we were there, that's the direction that the sun was coming in. So it may have been that there was some local heating. We don't know. But this is the type of uh, this is the type of thing that we then spend quite a while trying to figure out. And if you see all those little dots, that's the detail I was talking about before with the uh, with the flow, you know, the thermal flow bringing stuff up, having it circulate down and go down again, kind of like what you see with clouds on the Earth. Hey, um, Dan, can we yes, can we inject a question there on that on on, on that that sure. slide, please? Daniel, uh, go for it. Open your mic and. Pose your question. Hi, Dennis. Um, are you saying that there's subduction on the surface of Pluto like there is in the Earth's surface, which is due to plate tectonics? Are there plates on the surface of Pluto? Not plates. This is that there are areas where th this big area, um, there's, there's uh, perhaps a generation of heat going down inside Pluto, whether it's, you know, from radioisotopes or whether it's just because you're getting phase changes in these um, in these objects, but they're heating up, and the the heat is coming from that. So nothing is moving as a whole, but in these areas you're getting a heat flow coming in, and then yes, you get the subduction from that. So it sort of stays there. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, and then okay, so Bill, Bill Burton is uh, pointing out that the the Aladrisi area looks like a series of rotated fault blocks like uh, the like the basin and range yep it's again it's it's uh, it's it's not from plate tectonics so to speak it's from you know the local heating and other activities that are going on the 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 gravitational uh, force is pretty small on Pluto as is the you know rotational force but then the objects that are there, uh, you know, they aren't strong like rocks. They're weaker. Nitrogen is not, you know, liquid, solid nitrogen doesn't hold itself together that well. So there's there's things that are going on that are can happen there that wouldn't happen. Uh, well, the, the forces would not make things on the Earth move like these. Right? Great. Thank you. Uh, so this is the composition. Now, this is what we get from the LISA instrument. And so remember I was talking about when you look at the reflected uh, light, you get a signature. So if you look at these, the, the, the various curves that are shot there, what that is, is that sort of a, if you look at the amount of solar light hitting Pluto, because you know how we know that from how far away Pluto is, and then you look at how much is reflected back, that's what I over F means. It means, um, um, uh, you know, the, the reflected over the 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 the, uh, uh, the amount that's hitting the surface, and you can see that if you go along in wavelength, you see all these little sort of sharp features in there. That's because this is made out of um, uh, uh, methane, and these are methane has these structures in it because the way that the uh, the uh, molecules put together. You know, it's a carbon with four hydrogens in it, and how they move, the the, ener the energy um, that it takes to move them around in different motions um, corresponds to different wavelengths of light. So a photon comes in of the right wavelength, and it can excite that motion. Then it gets absorbed. But if it's not at the right wavelength to excite that motion, um, it get re it gets reflected. And so that's what you're seeing here is that where you see the smaller numbers, that means there's less reflected light because the the uh, the, uh, the the molecules are or the it's not the surface composition is is absorbing uh, the wavelengths at those particular things because that's what methane does. It's where it absorbs the light, and so this is what we use to see what's going on on the surface. So you see the methane features down at there, down in the 2.2 to 2.4 micron region. There's also that's that's carbon um, carbon dioxide is down in there and carbon CO also. Um, and if you start looking in other areas, there's a little shoulder 
uh, at around 2.15 uh, microns. That's that nitrogen feature I was talking about. And exactly how that looks, again, depends on the, on the uh, uh, structure of nitrogen. But these are the spectra taking it different places. And you can see that in that heart-shaped area, things usually look like they have structure. Um, although sometimes it changes. That blue line is actually looks like water ice. And in fact, there's a little area out there that seems to have water ice in it that's not covered by the, the nitrogen which, and, the, and the methane. Uh, it presumably is a place where it's a little bit warmer. And so the methane and the nitrogen went off and you see the, uh, the water feature that's underneath it. Um, but if you look over in that bluish area, it's flat. And that's because presumably that's very old material and it's been processed by you know the radiation coming off of the sun the 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 ions coming off of the sun the the, the uh, um so that it's sort of if you have methane and you hit it with uh, radiation well now all of a sudden you have uh, ethane you know you have instead of a ch4 you have a c2h6 and then you keep on building more and more complex structures and when the structures get very complex they sort of absorb it all the way different wavelengths and so you don't see as much structure there. So that's what we think is going on there is that's an older surface, a surface that has been exposed much longer than these uh, newer surfaces, which presumably are getting in, uh, uh, you know, new nitrogen from the atmosphere and so on. As it circulates around the, the, the planet, or excuse me, not the planet, the, uh, the object. It's, remember, we're, we're not a real planet anymore. Anyway, um, <laughs> if you now start to look at, you know, the various bands, um, again, you can see this little CO2 feature, CO feature there, um, the N2 feature, there's the water features that were bigger. That's what we're looking for is we're looking for those little details. And that's what we end up seeing differently in those different areas. Um, now we can also look at, we have a channel in MVIC that is sensitive to, uh, to methane. It's a narrow band channel. And we compare that to what we see in Lisa, and they look pretty similar. So that's a good sign that we're getting two measures in different wavelength regions that are telling us, yeah, that's pretty much where the where the methane is. So you know, we're very confident that, yep, that's that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing methane. And again, all this detail is because we're there. You know, it's something that you could never see from 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 the Earth or, you know even much closer to Pluto until you, we were at our closest, we were about 10,000 kilometers from, uh, from, from Pluto. We took our, most of our spectral measurements, our compositional measurements when we were about a hundred thousand kilometers away, because we wanted to get the whole surface. Mm -hmm. So again, here's the, well, you know, I can go through and, and, and show you the distribution of the various, uh, the various objects, but this is where the methane is. And again, it's in that Sputnik planum, which is where, um, you know, there's new material there. It hasn't been processed as much as the uh, Chitulo region, Regio, which has been presumably not, you know, not resurfaced for quite a while. Um, it's kind of interesting though, if you look, and this is the N2 ice absorption. And again, it's kind of where the methane is. Um, CO again is kind of where the, the methane is. It's the active areas. H2O ice, um, if you look, there are some areas, these really sort of fine areas where you see a lot more water than you do in the areas around it. We're not quite sure why that happens, but if you really look at detail, and I'm hoping that's this one, yeah, you see that little blue thing there? That's actually water ice, and it's showing up in that very narrow region there. Um, we're not sure why that's happening, why it's not showing up sort of more distributed, distributed, excuse me, around there. Um, it doesn't mean that there's not water in the, the non-blue areas. It can be mixed with other species, but that, you know, what we saw in those things were pretty much like, pretty much like pure water. It's a, Charon is, is got a very watery surface um, because it has less gravity than Pluto, so it can't hold on to the the um, the object, the species like methane and uh, uh, nitrogen, because 
they come off the surface and it, the gravity is not enough to hold them from just sort of escaping. So that's kind of the reason that there's a difference between the Pluto composition and the Charon composition. Um, and again, this shows all kinds of different spectra. So this is stuff that we're still looking at, not only us, everybody is still looking at, to understand exactly what's going on, why we're having this thing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, again, thanks a lot for, for, for funding this. Uh, you know, this is the type of, uh, of uh, work that tells us, you know, the, the Pluto objects uh, in the Kuiper belt are the most pristine objects in our solar system. They right? you know, haven't been processed by the sun. They haven't come in and have all the things go on, with, which has gone on in the inner solar system. So we're looking at sort of this is a kind of a time machine. We're looking at, you know, something that's four and a half billion years old. And it's really kind of what it was like four and a half billion years ago. Hmm. This I love. This is an MVIC pan image taken soon after closest approach. And it looks like you're on the earth. There are mountains, there are clouds. That's, those clouds are real. There are um, uh, particles in the atmosphere around Pluto. Now, again, it's the, it's, it's, you know, uh, solid nitrogen, solid uh, methane, uh, water, and so on and so forth. It's quite different than it is on the earth, but the physics, you know, it, it just sort of leaps at you and says, huh, there's, there's, interesting things that go on in these places. Now this crepuscular stuff, this is interesting too. This tells us how high the mountains are. If, I, if you look in that area that's yellow, and you look in finer detail, you see those black streaks? That's because those mountains are shielding the sun from hitting on the other side of those uh, areas. And so we see this on the earth also, but it sort of tells you, you know, well, I'm at this distance away, so I've got a mountain this high. That's why I don't, you know, it's blocking the sun. And uh, it's just not something that one was expecting to see. So, again, everything we knew was wrong before we got there. Hazes. This is a color image of Pluto's hazes, and it really is blue. I mean, it's all around the whole surface, and they go several hundred kilometers above the surface. Um, in the blue region, you can see them going up several hundred kilometers, but in the other ones, they don't. Methane is a much longer wavelength. The near IR is a much longer wavelength. They don't scatter light as well um, as, or excuse me, blue light is scattered better by objects, by particles than the longer wavelengths are. And so that's why you can see things going further up in the atmosphere in blue is because uh, smaller particles, which is what's happening when you're growing up, still scatter blue light, but they don't scatter red, near-infrared, and uh, methane light. And the methane, there's some noise in there. You can see some variation. Um, we're talking about an object that's, you know, 2,000 times dimmer than the Earth or something like that. So it's it's not surprising that there are some little problems with... Uh, Dennis, the, the, the prior photo with the, with the blue uh, rim, is that a false color image or is that true color? That's, that's from our blue camera. That's I mean it's it's false color in the sense that it's owing it's showing how things um, it wouldn't be exactly what your eye would see, but it's showing you that yeah it's mainly in the blue. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Good. we don't have quite the you know the we don't have blue, red, and green. We have blue um, something that is uh, near infrared. Uh, uh, part of that near infrared is where the methane is. And then there's a sort of a reddish thing. Yeah. So this okay. is kind of a, you know, but it is it is heavily blue. Got it. Okay, thank you. For this. And here's some of uh, the other objects. So this is, um, we, we looked at this with Lori. Lori has got a much higher uh, uh, angular resolution than, than um, MVIC does but it doesn't have the color channels. So what we did a lot of is we would take colors from Envic, from the Ralph stuff, and then mix them with what we saw uh, from the higher resolution, higher spatial resolution, Lori images, and, de and develop a, obviously not exact, but a, a, what we think is a good estimate of what sort of the real color details look like um, by using the higher resolution 
um, and you see this red skull cap, which is, um, you know, it shows that this this area up there is a different uh, composition than the rest of the area. Now, is that you also notice that it kind of looks a little bit like a crater. So the question is, is that a crater or is that, you know, just sort of the way that the uh, that the um, uh, that that the object formed with this little depression in the top? Because you can see there are cracks there. Um, and again, we're not exactly sure why the cracks are there. I, you know, I don't think it's a uh, it's not, uh, you know, like. Uh, motion like on the earth but uh, it may have been that there was a, a collision and it sort of formed cracks around and it gave us a different structure uh, on the top this is sort of interesting also this is this the green area there that's an area where there's um, uh, ammonia and you look around and there are other craters and you don't see the ammonia so it's not clear whether that ammonia is there because it was a, an impact that you know, the object that was impacted the surface contained ammonia, or is there ammonia under the surface where that thing happened to impact? Um, but we do see that different, you know, different craters have a different structure. So it's a, it's an interesting, uh, 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 interesting effect. Let's put it that way. And then these are all the, um, the small moons of Pluto. Uh, you know, Charon is, is roughly, uh, sort of a, a quarter of the size of Pluto, excuse me. Um, and these guys are much smaller. In fact, when we started the mission, we only knew about, um, uh, 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 you know, Charon. And then Nix and Hydra were found uh, sort of right after we launched. And then Styx and Karabos were found much later. They're much smaller. They were, uh, they were found by, uh, by uh, uh, observations with the Hubble telescope. Dennis, uh, Daniel's asking another question about yeah. a sense as to whether or not, or, you know, when those craters might have been formed when the collisions occurred. We're not sure. Um, uh, and again, it's it's because, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of the way that you typically look at like the, the near Earth asteroids in the asteroid belt, you, you kind of know how many asteroids there are there and how much they collide and so you can kind of figure out uh what's the probability that you get a certain size crater over a certain time uh much less is known about the kuiper belt so we're not exactly sure when those things occurred people have, have given different estimates um and that's one of the things we're looking into okay yes sir thank you and then we did the extended mission um, which went to MU69 uh, uh, on New Year's Day of 2019. And here again, you know, we found this MU69 by looking at uh, objects, uh, color uh, images in the Hubble, and you can see something moving, so you know something's out there, but it's just this blob. And if you, you know, we say, okay, we could, we could get there. We, you know, we didn't have, you have to, be able to use the fuel that we have left to get there. Um, and it was one of the few things that we could find that we could get there much darker because we're, you know, um, uh, twice as far away. Um, and it reflects less also. Um, we're going to try to get four times, we got four times closer, but it's a lot smaller than Pluto. And uh, the spacecraft power is going down because the uh, radioisotopes are, you know, decaying. So we went out there and we saw this thing and we thought, well, gosh, okay, so this is two objects. It looks like a bowling ball. Um, and people were quite sure that there were two spheres that had joined together and hit. Um, and that's sort of a, a, at the time, that was a theory that was kind of um, in vogue. But when we got really close, we saw this. And this doesn't really show the whole thing. It's obviously things that are loosely joined together they slowly join together, but it turns out that that bottom one, the larger one, almost looks more like a dish than it does a uh, uh, a, uh, 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 a sphere. And the top one looks somewhat like a sphere. And then in between where they joined, you can see the, the high albedo. That's, um, uh, you know, we, 
have to assume that there's a that this is a low velocity impact if um you know they things formed in the, uh, in, the uh, in next to each other and then they slowly came in and sort of joined together so this is really sort of two objects after they've joined um as we got closer in you can see all kinds of details there are uh, 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 uh craters there um, it looks like a person right um, that whole thing down there is is a flat plate. You see this little uh, uh, circle around it. There's bright features in the cloves. There's there's uh, colors going on. Again, all the types of stuff that we're still looking at. This was when we were uh, about six thousand kilometers before closest approach. Uh, and this is the albedo variations, and again in in various uh, colors. This is the composite of the Lori images when we're uh, very close to the thing. Um, this is a 33 meter per pixel, so higher resolution. And it really is an interesting object. Um, but still, you couldn't tell that it was, it was flat. We found that out after we went on the other side. And I'll, I'll go a little faster because I think, I think there's some other stuff. This is kind of what it looks like. We found out after we went by, you know, first we thought it was these two spheres. And then we found out that when we went by, we looked at stars and they weren't occluded as if, as, as it would be as if they were spheres. So it kind of looks more like that thing on the bottom than it does on the top. And it really was not anything anybody expected. You always expect things to kind of be spherical. These aren't. And this is the face on view. Uh, this is the Envic and Lisa composition. Again, we're far out. We're getting a lot less sensitive. Possibly there's uh, nitrogen or water ice. Possibly there's uh, meth methanol, CH3AOH on there. We're still looking into that. Um, you know, we have to do a lot to try to clean up these images. So very diverse super surface on something that, uh, you know, you didn't expect anything to be different. It has old and new regimes. It has atmosphere that has haze layers. It has... Uh, and also very surface compositions. There's convective overflow. Um, a lot of things going on that we just did not expect. Uh, same thing for MU69. Nobody expected to see these sort of non-spherical things joining together. So it tells you why it's a good idea to go out and see these things. And I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't even know what time it is. Um, um, do I have time to go on? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll stop after this one because this is, this is sort of tears on Landsat 8. So Landsat has been, you know, being launched since 1973 was when Landsat first came in. And Landsat 3 was the first time there was a thermal infrared sensor. Now, the thermal channels are actually looking, they're not looking at reflected solar. All the stuff we saw with Pluto is reflected light coming from the thing. They're, the solar, the thermal channels are actually looking at what the Earth is putting out in, uh, in long wavelength infrared. So it's kind of the opposite. Of what you'd ex of what you see with something with the operational land imager, the thing the images you usually see from from Landsat, you know the the pictures that uh, the Google Maps uses and so on and so forth. Um, so Landsat goes around the Earth and it it operate it, it's in an orbit that every 16 days, sort of as the Earth rotates underneath it, it goes above and below, and you get back to where you were uh, 16 days before. So every 16 days, you're back to the same position you were because um, it doesn't have a hugely wide field of view. It's 185 kilometer field of view. Um, and originally um, on Landsat 8, the idea was to make it sort of a, a commercial thing. And there wasn't a lot of interest in having the infrared sounder on it. But then people found out in the West that, oh my gosh, if you look at the reflected solar light and then the thermal radiation from fields that are being irrigated, you get a good feel for how much the plants are, how much water the plants are, uh, what's called evapotranspiring, uh, or transpiring. It's the water that, you know, when like you cool down when you sweat, plants cool down when they, uh, when they uh, uh, you know, do photosynthesis because the, the water comes out on the surface. And so you get a feel for how much, um, uh, irrigation is going, what, what the water is going on out there. And, you know, as uh, Mark Twain said, 
uh, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting over. That's that's what it is sort of out west. You really want to understand, um, you know, uh, how how irrigation is being done so that because if I irrigate, well, that means the person who's downriver from me can't perhaps if I irrigate too much. So there, you know, you'd like to be able to monitor what's going on. And that was found out to be something that the combination of the infrared channels and the uh, and the visible channels were really good at predicting. Um, this is instrument overview. It's got two pretty broad thermal channels and they're they're in different slightly different areas because when you look down at the earth um, it's a pain for us because we have to look through the atmosphere now everybody else likes the atmosphere but you know if you're trying to understand what's going on on the surface well the atmosphere sort of affects that and so we take two channels next to each other so we can try to take out the effect of the uh, of the atmosphere on what we're measuring um, this is something this detector since it's working so far in infrared it has to be cooled to roughly 43 Kelvin. So, you know, solid ice, solid nitrogen ice temperature. Um, we have a cryo cooler on there that does that. Um, it's not something that you can do passively. And we look, our, our sensitivity is sort of on the order of a thousand, a hundredth, of, excuse me, a tenth of a Kelvin, uh, sort of kind of how well we can measure things. Um, this is just a picture of, of the tiers. That's the blue instrument there. Um, much bigger. This thing weighs, you know, the Pluto instrument I was showing you weighs about uh, 12 kilograms, and this weighs about 200. Um, and th the reason is that when you're in Earth orbit, you want to be able to take a lot more data. You can use all the power that's coming from the solar cells that are close by. You don't have to have such a large um, uh, rocket to launch you into, you know, something far away. So, it's a lot less restrictive than, than planetary stuff. So we have the, the um, tiers there, the thermal red channel, and then the operational land imager. And again, the land imager, that's the, the pictures that you see, uh, typically see on, uh, you know, when they show uh, Landsat images, mm -hmm. because those are kind of the visible to shortwave infrared, uh, near infrared uh, wavelengths. Um, I won't get into the details of how it's made, um, but I do want to talk a little bit. We made this thing, and again, there was the unexpected noise sources and thermal mechanical problems. Uh, we had a time when we were uh, we had a, a power supply for the cryo cooler, and the capacitors in it all blew up. Uh, you know, that's the type of thing. There was an earthquake while we were doing in Maryland, while we were doing thermal testing. Right? You know, so, okay, normal stuff, except for the earthquake. Um, we weren't expecting that, um, but got everything built and we delivered it to the spacecraft. And when we turned it on in the spacecraft, um, we found out it didn't work anymore. It didn't cool down. And at first we thought, oh my gosh, that means the electronics is messed up. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of concern. Uh, have we, did the electronics get messed up when we shipped it out there? Did something happen? Did things um, uh, go bad? Well, it, Turns out that the, the cryocoolers, to get that cold, you have to use helium. Every other gas freezes at those temperatures. And so helium is something that people use for detecting leaks in systems because you don't see much helium around. So if I have a, a vacuum system and I want to see if there's a leak, I put helium someplace else and see if I see helium coming out at a detector. Um, and so we said, well, let's look and see what happens with the, this when we look at, uh, see if there's a helium leak. And this is what happens. That's the detector you're putting up there. You're not hearing anything. Now, as you get up sort of towards the end of the thing, that's telling you there's helium coming out of the cryo cooler, which was the best day of my life because now we understood why we were having a problem and it's something we could fix. So um, it turned out that the reason we had the problem was that the, they filled the thing with helium and then crimped it, but they had some problems crimping it. So it turned out that the crimping was only 100 microns long. And 100 microns is not a whole lot of stuff, so eventually it broke. And when it broke, it let out the helium, but we could fix that. Okay, it's recording. Yeah, keep going. 
So um, we fixed it. We launched it. And this is what I was talking about with the uh, what what one of the big uses is is for looking at evapotranspiration. Now that's the you, you know how much light is coming in with the with the invert with the uh, visible channels. You can see how much is being reflected, and with the thermal channels, you can see how much is, heat is being generated. And you can use that and models of what the surface uh, uh, water transport is like to get a feel for how much uh, 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 you know moisture there must be there in the soil to give you that cooling that you're seeing where the uh, plants are sort of sweating and, and uh, uh, cooling themselves down. So again, this is a it's a it's a energy net balance between the solar radiation coming down and the long wave radiation coming coming back up. Now, it sounds like it's impractical. The idea is to prevent stomatal suicide. Plants, if you, you know, they'll try to keep on producing even if they don't have enough water. And so you want to find out when they're being stressed um, to, uh, to say, hey, maybe we should do some more irrigation in this spot. Turns out that um, the people using it, um, some at the University of Mar Arizona, or excuse me, University of Maryland developed the technology, the technique, the, the, the analysis technique to do it. But the people using it, ah, sorry, keep on saying that. So this is just the various um, uh, sort of resolutions that you get from Earth orbiting satellites. Um, if you look at the sort of the geostationary ones, there are satellites that sort of sit over one part of the Earth and they rotate they orbit at the same rate that the Earth uh, rotates, so they don't move with respect to that, those ge geostationary satellites, but they're high up, and they have like 10 kilometer resolutions, um, maybe five kilometers. Then you have sort of broad uh, polar orbiting satellites like Landsat, but they want to cover a whole lot of area, so they don't have high spatial resolution, so they have sort of a kilometer resolution. And then you get the Landsat stuff in the water, in the, in the thermal, which is 60 meters. And that's where you can start to see individual fields. Um, and that's what gets very interesting in the, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, you know, looking at that evapotranspiration. Let me just, Gallo Vineyards is one of the places that we were using this on. So it has a practical effect. I mean, if, you know, if you want wine, you want, uh, and Gallo is a good place to go. So, um, um, and this is not, you know, again, this is not, you know, advertising anything. This is just sort of saying that, yeah, people, um, uh, you know, do do use these data to try to understand practical effects somewhat different than what's going on on Pluto. Um, and I'll, again, go through it. So this on the right is the evapotranspiration. It shows how much um, how much water is coming off of the plants. And you can see that the, the greener it is, the more water is coming out, that means the more active the things are. That means that they probably have been, uh, 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 you know, uh, irrigated the right amount. And the other places, you know, some of this is just when the data is taken, so that you know they're they're looking at some they're they're irrigating some plants and not others because that's just sort of the uh, the, uh, the the harvest cycle, so to speak. But it does give you inter interesting information. And I won't go into this. This is, we, we compared what we saw with our combination of the visible and the infrared from Landsat with what was measured um, on the ground, you know, close in. And we got very good agreement between the two. So it's a very useful system. And it's what, you know, remote sensing is good for. You can look at the whole earth with something that's orbiting it. If you have to go out and measure each place individually, now, there are a lot of places where you don't see a whole heck of a lot. So this is another one. This is a, a volcano uh, that um, you could see the flow of the lava under the ground in the thermal infrared. You can't see it in the, uh, in the visible. Um, you need to see something that tells you how hot stuff is. And it, it's, uh, so you can use that to see what's going on under the ground. Um, uh, hopefully this doesn't mess me up. I think you guys still can see stuff, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And let me go down to the next one. Yep. Yeah, this is 
sort of have to finish this. And it should be pretty soon that it should come back and say, go ahead. So actually, Dennis, while you're while you're pausing, um, Amanda Keener had a question. Actually, Jake Keener had a question. Amanda, yeah. are you on? Would you mind opening your mic? You're welcome to ask your question. Or Jake. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, so um, with the uh, New Horizons mission, I saw that like you said that it went on past into the Kuiper Belt. Um, did the um, data that it retrieved from the uh, um, objects that it passed so, like support or um, like did it support the theory that there could be a ninth planet beyond the orbit of Neptune that's throwing these objects around? Ah, uh, okay. Um, not really. Um, it's there. They have found. Uh, okay, so you know Pluto was the last was the ninth planet found um, because it's it's the largest of the closer in Kuiper Belt objects. They have found bigger Kuiper Belt objects further out, but there's no um, there's no evidence that there's a you know a planet X out there that's uh, that's pertur perturbing things. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh heck, what's going on? Oh gosh! Suddenly it's uh, oh gosh! Ah, there we go. Here. And so you know, we used it to look at the uh, uh, at a warm thing. We've also used tears to look at a the coldest spot on the Earth, which is uh, down obviously in the uh, Antarctic. And we found an area which is uh, minus ninety three degrees C. It's the coldest that's ever been measured anywhere on the Earth. Um, and it turns out that it's kind of interesting because it's in an area where there's a lot of sort of mountains, but the coldest uh, thing is not in the mountains. If you look here, the lowest temperatures um, are where, um, yeah, the lowest temperatures are sort of in, in, in valleys. And it's kind of what happens is that the cold air settles there and uh, just keeps cooling down a bit. And so um, people were, somewhat surprised about that. It's not a huge, you know, it's not a huge discovery, but it's interesting that, uh, you know, the coldest areas were being found not at the top of the hills, but sort of in the, in the valleys. So, and then there's this, and this is why it's nice to have the infrared and the visible. So this is an area of the, uh, of the uh, Antarctic where um, you know you hear about uh, large ice sheets calving right down there breaking off and so on and so the three pictures on the left are oli images they're the normal sort of visible images you get by looking at the reflected solar radiation and you can kind of see that there's black areas over there that's where the water is because the water doesn't reflect as well as the ice does but when you get down into the two pictures to the right, it's in June. Well, in the Antarctic, June is winter. There's no light there. So you can't see anything in the visible. And now all of a sudden, if you look at the difference between those two, you see this big stripe open up. Now that's actually an iceberg calving, a really large iceberg breaking off. Um, and you kind of, it's interesting because you'll notice that the areas where you are, are are white are the areas where you're seeing the water, whereas in the OLI, the areas that are black are the areas where you're seeing the water. And again, it's because ice is much more reflective than water. So if you're looking at reflected stuff, um, it looks blacker, but water is much warmer than ice. And so when the ice breaks apart, you're seeing down to the warmer water and it looks brighter than the, uh, than the, uh, than the ice does, which is just colder. Um, this is what other things we use. There's, if you look at that little splice over there in the black area, um, that's an area where there's a uh, power plant putting out water. And you can see that it's heating up the water where it puts it out. So it's something that, again, you like to know what's going on because it changes the environment of the uh, you know, for the animals and so on that are in that area. So 
You kind of want to know things like that. We also use it for vector-borne diseases because oftentimes they're associated with, um, with areas of uh, uh, higher soil moisture because it's an area of, you know, that's where uh, 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 mosquitoes breed and so on and so forth. And so if you find an area that, that allows you to sort of see what the soil moisture is, it also helps you figure out maybe there's an area where you're having, um, you know, uh, vector breeding of various types of diseases. So these data um, are used for a wide range of things, and they're free, by the way. Uh, the the uh, U.S. Geological Survey, or service, uh, U.S. Geological Service uh, survey uh, provides these for free. You can download it, uh, both in the infrared and the, and the visible. So, you know, even though we had a lot of problems with tears and, and getting it, and we thought for a while that we were just not going to be able to uh, get it launched, once in orbit, it's really providing information that's interesting and uh, useful. And uh, it's, it's I'm, I'm not trying to sell anything. It's just, it's sort of a, it shows you how, how good remote sensing is, how much you can learn from remote sensing uh that you wouldn't have uh thought until you start doing the remote sensing and then starting seeing things like that and i i, I do have another thing where i talk about the uh the osiris uh, uh, uh mission uh, but i see it's nine o'clock so probably i should stop now right uh well i would certainly like to turn it open to other folks if anyone has has other questions for dennis Um, Bill, go ahead. You're welcome to open your mic if you want to ask it, or I'm happy to ask it for you, whichever you prefer. Sorry, I had my microphone off. So you've cited a couple anomalies tonight that you were able to correct. Uh, what do you the What do you think about the Webb telescope? It sounds like it's inevitable something will be off, and you think you'll be able to fix it. Yeah. And, and the reason is, um, so I don't know if you remember, but when Hubble was first launched, um, it was out of focus. Uh, they had, you know, there, there had been a, a, some data that was not paid enough attention to. And so, you know, people could go out and fix it. Um, that's not the case for web. We can't fix that type of thing. We can't, you know, it's, it's much further out. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of effort going in making sure that it's it's working correctly. Now, if you get to the point of, like I said, you know, for for uh, for the Pluto, um, we didn't we weren't able to do as much radiometric cal uh, sorry radiometric calibration means uh, here's a signal. What does that correspond to in terms of how many photons are hitting the instrument? Um, but once you're out there, there are stars that are well calibrated. And you can look at the Earth. That's something we did on Osiris Rex, or on yeah, on Osiris Rex. We you know we use the Earth to get us some information. So as long as it's not something that that um, is uh, you know uh, a, a non fixable thing, um, and even for the Web, even for excuse me for uh, Hubble, they were able to do deconvolution and get some of the uh, uh, resolution back. Um, you don't see much of that anymore because they, they fixed it. But there's a lot of ways to work around things once you're in orbit. And um, uh, that's kind of what we're used to in, a, in another thing is that there's always, well, the other thing is that there's requirements and those requirements are sort of what you need to get the science that you've defined. But as you go out there, you find out that, oh, you know, if I could measure this a little bit better, then I could do some other science. And so a lot of effort goes into doing that sort of thing as well. So it'll be it'll be very nice when Web is launched. And uh, I think it's going to be very impressive. So anyone else have a question for Dennis? So, okay, well, then I'll take 
my my privilege here and ask one of mine. Uh, when you started the the presentation, Dennis, you you were talking about New Horizons, how you know it's a one shot deal. You fly by, there's no going back. You can't do a U turn. You're not going into orbit. Um, is it feasible to put something uh, in orbit around Pluto or another KBO, or does it just, or does that just take too much mass of fuel to decelerate once you're there? And um, it's people are actually looking into it, and it's been proposed. <clears throat> Excuse me, and you know the the you end up doing things like not using chemical propulsion, right? You use electric propulsion, something that, uh, that uh, you know, instead of burning, you know, mixing two chemicals together and burning it, you, you accelerate, you ionize the thing, accelerate it with an electric field, and it gets things going much faster than, a, than, than the burning does. And so, you know, it can take time to get out there, but then um, you can, you um, uh, um, you, you can control things, you know, mm -hmm. you don't need to carry all that fuel to slow yourself down. And that's, that's the big problem is that if I have to carry a lot of fuel to slow myself down, well, that means I need a huge rocket, which means, you know, it's even heavier and so on and so forth. Right. And, or it's fewer scientific instruments that you can carry. Exactly. A lot. Yeah. And it, usually it's, it's the, as I said, you know, we go through a lot of effort to make sure the science instruments are, are not very massive. So getting rid of them, you know, it, it, it helps, but it's not the solution. Um, mm -hmm. The Japanese have also uh, proposed using a solar sail, right? To mm -hmm. and now that's not to go out to Pluto, but to go out to the Kuiper, or excuse me, to the uh, Trojan objects, the ones that we're going to with Lucy, which is you know sort of around uh, Jupiter, and then going into an orbit around them uh, because you don't have again you don't have to carry all that excess fuel. So um, there are there are people looking into trying to do that because the uh, Kuiper Belt objects are such uh, such uh, pristine objects. Yeah. So, so then one one other one that, I, that I've got, uh, you know, New Horizons was a 10-year trip to get out to Pluto. Um, so here we are 10 years beyond the technology you had when you built the instruments for New Horizons. What's the current state of the art? Okay, so um, if I had, so let me let me tell you, we have an instrument that's very much like Ralph, uh, the Ralph instrument that's on New Horizons, uh, on the Lucy instrument, uh, the Lucy mission that we're doing to the to the Trojans. So the the Lucy the instrument on uh, the Lisa instrument on Ralph on New Horizons has got a 256 by 256 element uh, infrared detector in it that cuts off at two and a half microns. On Ralph, we have a 2000, well, 2020, you know, uh, 2000 by 2000 detector, uh, in, uh, element detector that cuts off closer to four microns. And we can keep it at the same temperature that we had to, that we had to take the, uh, the Pluto instrument to because the, the detector technology has improved so much. So, um, also, an order of magnitude on each dimension. Yep, and more sensitivity. And more sensitivity, and and um, uh, in both ways, it 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 is not as sensitive to being warm. Uh, we can run it at warmer temperatures, and we don't have to worry about the dark current so much. And the the inherent response of the detector has gone up by a factor of two or three. And the filters we use to uh, to get the spectrum and the spectra have become much more uh, transmissive. So we're talking literally several times an order of magnitude, higher sensitivity and uh, more capability. Wow. And similarly with the, with the visible part, we can sort of pick how many uh, uh, detectors we use and we can optimize things so that we can uh, measure things that are you know, if you're trying to do a single scan and one of your uh, wavelengths is much more bright than the others, well, something will saturate and the other one you won't get much data, but we've managed to work it so that we can do both at the same time. So it's that sort of thing. And, and a lot better memory storage and all kinds of stuff like that. 
wow, that's that, that's fun. <laughs> and, and what's sort of weird is that it's still sort of, you know, we'll launch Lucy with something that's really cool, but it's really already obsolete, not quite obsolete, but I mean, you know, there are better things already because you can't, obviously, you know, you have to, you have to launch the thing and it has to be finished. So you can't just sort of keep on changing the, the, the technology. Wow. Well, Dennis, thank you very much for this. I mean, there's, uh, there's a number of folks with uh, comments in the chat room with thanks for the great presentation. Uh, you know, of course, Paul, you know, so thank you for the interesting presentation and all the work on the remote sensing. Um, other folks have, have, have had similar comments. We're just very interested in, 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 in all of this stuff. So I can't thank you enough for joining us. Well, I can't, I can't thank, you know, everybody for, for supporting NASA like this. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 we, we, we work off the money that we get from, uh, from what people pay. So, uh, it's, we hope that we're, uh, you know, it's, it's good stuff. I'm sorry. It is good stuff. Absolutely. It is good stuff. Oh, and I'm going to steal the presentation back for just a moment here and remind folks that next uh, next month we have uh, our uh, on August 9th is our meeting and we're going to welcome back Joe Pesh, the program director from the National Science Foundation, uh, the the Department of or an Astrophysicist back there. I don't have the full details of what Joe's going to talk about, but uh, when he joined us last year, man, was it entertaining and, and full of good information. So, uh, you know, watch the watch the emails and the website for information about the about the meeting link for this one coming up again second Sunday in August at 7.30. And with that, everybody, thank you all for joining uh, joining us for the meeting tonight. Uh, you know, I'm, I invite you, anybody who wants to unmute your mic, let's give, uh, let's, let's, let's give Dennis a, a, a round of applause or a good huzzah and we'll see everybody in the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.